Hey guys, Ben Brewster here from Trade Athletics, and today I wanted to talk about a common uh, mistake that I typically see as it relates to periodizing grip training, forearm training over the course of the off season, and as it relates to throwing intensity and volume. And this is kind of an intuitive thing, but it's something that commonly gets screwed up. A lot of times it gets lost in communication between the pitching coach, between the actual athletes, and between the strength coach. There's some sort of miscommunication here. Um, a lot of it stems from pitchers not necessarily being able to communicate how their arm is feeling to their coaches. So that's point number one. But I'm going to talk about how you periodize grip training. This is important because we know that the forearms and specifically the flexor pronator are crucial in terms of injury prevention. So we know the studies have shown that the flexor pronator mass is able to take stress off the UCL during high valgus loads. So the stronger the forearms, the stronger the flexor pronator mass, in theory, and all else being equal, the less loading that there should be placed on the UCL during throwing. So it's important to have the strong forearms, but there's a double-edged sword to this. So the flip side is that if you over fatigue your forearms and then you go out and try to throw during max effort, during high volume throwing phases or in season, um, you can actually do more harm than good. So while we do want a strong grip and while it does have a place uh, grip training in the overall yearly periodization scheme, you need to be careful about when you program very grip intensive movements and high volume grip training versus when you're going to be doing your higher volume throwing phases. So I'm going to take you through what that looks like. We're looking at throwing volume and intensity related to forearm or grip training volume and intensity. So as the Okay, so we're going from rest, early off season, mid to late off season, and preseason slash in season. Okay, so throwing volume and intensity, we're gonna start basically zero here during rest phase. Okay, as we get into on ramping, it's gonna increase. Throwing volume keeps increasing as we build up. We're gonna get into mid to late off season. We're gonna be in a very high intensity phase at this point, throwing a ton, maybe velocity training, weighted ball training, max effort long toss, that sort of thing three to five days a week of some sort of throwing. And that's gonna to start to peak right as we get into preseason slash in season. And that's where it's gonna level off. So as throwing volume intensity increases, we wanna see kind of this inverse relationship between throwing volume and intensity and your grip training volume intensity. So if you're gonna do any high stress grip training, you're gonna to wanna to program most of that during your rest periods or during the early off season. So that might look like this. Higher intensities right here start to decrease a little bit as we get into the early off season. Start to drop, 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 and go kind of into a baseline as we get in season. So looking at what do I mean by higher stress forearm training? Um, I wanna give credit to Dan Blewett who actually wrote an article on this topic in about tw uh, 2013 when I actually uh, worked with him out in Illinois. Um, but just to kind of summarize, Higher forearm stress training is things like high rep deadlifts, four by tens, five by eights, anything where by the end of the set, your grip starts to be a limiting factor and you really start to crush uh, your forearms. Uh, weighted carries, that's one of the biggest offenders when it comes to a lot of coaches don't necessarily, a lot of strength coaches don't think about the effect that, you know, farmers walk competitions or, uh, you know, weighted chin ups or, or weighted, uh, any sort of competition that involves forearm intensive training has on the athletes and their ability to recover. So uh, that's gonna be a big one. Weighted carries, really wanna limit those to early off season rest periods of throwing. Um, high volume weighted chin slash rows. Um, this is again, four by tens, three by twelves, five by eights. Anything that's gonna really be frying at your forearms is something you're gonna wanna save for earlier in the off season or during these rest periods. And grip intensive compound variation. So, you know, a lot of well-intentioned coaches will say, okay, well, we need to strengthen the forearms to work on preventing injuries. So we're gonna crush guys with fat grip chin-ups, fat grip rows, um, you know, using ropes for rows or um, chin-ups, anything like that. Again, that's very grip intensive. So while that does have a place, keeping those more towards the early off season rest phases and really starting to, to phase those out, if at all, during the in season and the very high, uh, high intensity throwing phases. As far as the less form intensive variations that you can do at other parts in the off season and in season, we're looking at low to moderate volume rows and deadlifts, things like three sets of three, three sets of eight, uh, four sets of six, 
things like that. Um, lower load form isolation, this includes things like Thrower's 10, six-way forms, where it's using lighter weight and it's more of a blood flow um, type recovery modality. Um, limiting grip intensive variations, again, we already covered that, and specifically no weighted carries. That's gonna be one of the quickest ways to piss off a lot of the pitcher's arms on your staff if you are giving them high intensity weighted carries, especially during fall ball, if they have to pitch in the next couple days, especially in season. This is one that we see repeatedly with strength coaches who wanna do fun competitions, just crushing all the pitchers, and then they have to go and pitch the next day. So really, really wanna make sure you guys avoid that in season and in high intensity throwing phases. I also wanna to touch on some research on throwing through fatigue and injury risk, just to really make this point clear. There's a study that compared pitchers who had had either elbow or shoulder surgery to pitchers in the same study who didn't end up having elbow or, sh or shoulder surgery during this time period. And in pitchers that reported regularly throwing through fatigue or pitching through fatigue, there was a 36-fold increase in injury risk or the risk of that they would end up having elbow or shoulder surgery. And in pitchers who said they occasionally through or pitch through fatigue, that was a fourfold increase in risk of getting that surgery. So really highlights the importance of not pitching through fatigue and of making sure that guys are keeping track of the type of training that they're doing and that that all kind of fits into this larger periodization scheme. Um, another point, another study showed that following an outing of roughly seven innings or 100 pitches, there was on average an 8% loss in grip strength. So. If any of you think that pitching isn't fatiguing your forearms, that's blatantly not true. Um, there's also a loss in internal rotation, horizontal adduction, um, and shoulder flexion. So a lot of these uh, adaptations, short-term adaptations, uh, that happen from being fatigued, from throwing, you wanna make sure you're not just going and crushing those same exact muscle groups in the weight room day before or day after. So overall point here, there needs to be a inverse relationship between your training stress and your throwing stress depending on where you're at in your off season. I wanna make a quick point about grip strength versus velocity versus what I would consider my hypothetical uh, or proposed injury risk. Um, this is more anecdotal than anything, but again, we do see that there's a relationship here. Um, whether or not there's been a study on that yet, this is kind of how I envision this matrix. So we have less than 80 miles an hour, 80 to 90 miles an hour, greater than 90 miles an hour, just trying to keep it simple. And then as far as grip strength numbers, you can look at this in terms of very weak grip strength, moderate grip strength, or very high grip strength. So again, looking back to stronger flexor pronator equals potentially less stress on the UCL. Um, what we see is guys who have elite velocity, but very, very weak, or very, very weak flexors in particular, um, those guys tend to get hurt more. So that would be considered the highest uh, risk group. And the lowest risk group in our experience, obviously guys who throw much slower, but who have very, very good strength. Those tend to be the guys that can throw for days, really not get sore, um, and tend to avoid any throwing related injuries. Um, within that, a couple of things to note is that even stronger athletes who are throwing over 90 miles an hour, there's gonna be at least a moderate injury risk. You simply can't not, cannot get around a elevated injury risk over slower throwers if you're throwing with elite velocity. There's still gonna be relatively low risk if you're throwing in that medium velocity range and have very good strength numbers. And the injury risk is still relatively low, even if you're weak, if you're throwing in that very slow velocity range. So that's just the general picture. Obviously there's a lot of other factors at play. If you have very good mechanics, very bad mechanics, um, leverages, anthropometry, all this other stuff obviously plays into injury risk. But just wanted to make the point that the stronger players who have worse velocity tend to get hurt less and the weaker players who have good velocity, um, those guys tend to get hurt more. So there is some sort of relationship here in our experience that's worth exploring.